uh, Jeff, I'm really pleased that we have you on the show. I didn't realize and just until recently that you're just up the street here over in Portland. And, you know, we should probably get together sometime. Uh, I think we've got a lot of um, common things in the area of uh, martial arts and so forth. And it's a really interesting time that we're talking because I was just working with a uh, client down in Phoenix and they are wanting to uh, start getting better at wellness. And um, I know it's a bigger topic these days with organizations. And so maybe you could, could you give us an overview as to why in particular, let's just take meditation. Um, I think we all sort of know that it's probably a good thing to do but a lot of us don't, but what's the, what's the investment? What's the payoff if we could find our own unique customized approach to meditation? What sort of benefits do you receive? What sort of benefits have you found others to receive? Well, I've been teaching the meditative arts for about 30 years now, and I've also been teaching the martial arts for about the same amount of time. And one of the things that I, has made me so passionate about the meditative arts is that I've literally seen, we've had over 24,000 students come through the academy here and I've seen endless lives change from adapting a meditation practice. Hmm. And one of the, one of the great things about the practice is you can do, I always tell new students when they come in here, that is, if you could just commit to at least 20 minutes a day and do some active practices. And what I mean by active practices, those could be as simple as one minute, three minutes, just revisiting that kind of place where you focus on the breath, where you bring your awareness inside the body, where you maybe do some spinal rotation, something that you can revisit and kind of connect with yourself throughout the day. And you do that a few times as well as have a ritual practice, say for 20 minutes a day, if you could just do that for a consistent period of time, say you do that for one year, two years, five years, the great thing about this practice is that with a minimal amount of effort, you can see endless results from it. And I've seen so many different people have life-changing stories coming through this practice, which is why now that I'm so passionate about trying to get this message out, you know, because it's always fun with the martial arts if... I'm teaching somebody who's coming in here and wants to say compete in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or do a boxing fight. That's always fun to take somebody to do that and have them be successful. But with the meditative arts, when somebody comes in here and they're suffering with anxiety or depression, or they're going through uh, stressful times and they learn how to use the meditative practice to change their whole life and their physiology and their mental approach to everything they do, that's extremely rewarding. And I've seen that happen over and over again through the years, which is why I'm so passionate about getting this message out. Guide us through how that would look. If we're, if I'm, I'm not driving, you know, let's, let's assume that somebody is listening to this and please don't <laughs> keep your hands on 10 and two. But if, if you were to give us a sort of a quick tutorial if there's somebody out there that's listening, that's intrigued, but they don't know where to start, what are some initial things that they could do? If, if you've got 20 minutes that I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to do this, Jeff, tomorrow morning, I'm going to get up and do my 20 minutes. As you had said, what should I do during that 20 minutes? All right. So that's a great question. And there's a lot of different directions you can take that. So you could do a sitting meditation, you could do standing meditation, you could do a movement meditation through a practice like uh, Tai Chi or a Qigong set or even uh, different yoga postures you could use. All of these are considered meditative arts. Hmm. And so when I talk about a ritual practice for 20 minutes, I'm talking about a time where you're not listening to any audios, you're not watching any videos, where you're turning inside and trying to build a more in tune connection with everything we do through our thoughts, through our movement, through our breath. And all of these things will help us make that deeper connection and also be able to evolve as time goes by. Now, some people have a difficult time sitting in one place for 20 minutes. And I've heard a lot of people say this, 
And so maybe for somebody like that, maybe a movement practice might be a better place to start. Maybe you do like a Qigong set or a Tai Chi form. Some people like the standing meditation, the sitting meditation, whatever it is, is good. If you're doing a sitting practice, a basic one that you could do is just do what we call normal abdominal breathing. And that's where we focus on both the inhale and exhale, trying to make them about an equal length and breathe in deep into the belly and then exhale, let every ounce of air out of your out of your lungs and then just continue this for 20 minutes and that's a real simple practice for somebody to get initiated into this but meditation is it's it's such a deep practice you know i've been studying this has been my career for over 30 years and i'm not the master i'm just a student i'm learning all the time and it's meant to be a practice that is always growing and always evolving and so if you're interested in wanting to take this on, I recommend one and most important is developing that ritual time, getting that 20 minutes where you're just building the habit because that's the hardest thing to teach people to do is to be consistent and to have that through time because it's one of those things where it builds up momentum. So, you know, you might meditate your first day and feel a little bit relaxed. But if you do that every day and just kind of make it part of your lifestyle, one year, five years, 10 years down the road, you're going to be surprised at everything that it's going to teach you. I love it. So should we be meditating at the same time or is it okay to scatter it throughout the day based on other factors that might affect our calendar? So it's good if you can to try to be consistent and maybe say, hey, do first thing in the morning with your ritual practice. However, I briefly talked about active practices as well. And so when, when I look at like an overall meditation plan, we have ritual practices, active practices, and philosophical practices. Active practices are what you can scatter throughout your day. And what I recommend when people are starting is maybe to set a reminder on your phone that goes off every 60 or 90 minutes. And that could be as simple as just counting out 10 breaths and coming mm. back and trying to connect with yourself or maybe doing some spinal rotations or maybe doing a movement exercise, something that helps bring you back into that meditative state because meditation isn't meant to be a hobby we do once in a while it's meant to be a way of life and we want to try to integrate these practices into everything we do and the cool thing about these active practices is that you can do when you're walking down the street or standing in line at the grocery store you know you don't have to take time out of your day to do this and the more that we integrate those we start to build that connection so through time as we're doing our ritual practice as well as our active practices, our ritual practices are getting to deeper and deeper states of meditation because now we're starting to live that way all day, every day. When you say deeper and deeper states of meditation, is, does that mean the experience of the, of the meditation becomes, it evolves over time? Or is it that we become much more in habit of doing it? Both. Maybe, maybe a little bit of both. So okay. in the beginning, you're going to notice, and, and this is, you know, I've heard this so many times through my years in teaching is people will come here and they'll say, ah, I've, I've tried meditation, but it just didn't work for me. I couldn't quiet the mind. And that's just a misunderstanding of what the practice is all about, because meditation isn't meant to be something where you go and you're in nirvana and you never think of any other thoughts, right? Everybody, I don't care if it's somebody who's been meditating for 60 years, you're going to have distractions and you're going to be thinking and being off center at different times. The idea with meditation is that we start to build the strength and the ability to every time we get off focus and we lose our train of thought, we either bring it back to the breath, we bring it back to our posture, we bring it back to a movement exercise that we're doing. 
And now it's kind of like if you go to the gym, you know, you do a bench press. If you pick mm. up the weight one time, you're not going to get very strong, but you do it over a couple of years, you're going to build up a lot of repetitions and pretty soon you're a pretty strong guy. And that's the idea with meditation is that you start to build repetitions of getting off track and bringing yourself back to focus. And now you start doing this 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 times. Mm. Now you're walking down the street and something bad happens and you easily get kind of derailed down a negative path. It's easy because you've had so many repetitions of bringing it back to focus. You can let that go and come back to center and deal with that with a more calm, peaceful mind that a lot of times will give you a more positive outcome to a negative situation. I can see it, but would you explain the relationship between meditation and martial arts? There's so many connections. Uh, and you know what? When I first started doing the meditative arts, I was into Western boxing and I had no desire to do anything meditative. You know, I was a young guy. I was about 19 years old. I used to go to this boxing gym that was uh, just a few blocks here from my academy and there was this coach there who was a very well-known coach. Uh, he created national and world champion level boxers. And at a boxing gym, if you're not familiar with that, it's not like a, a class where you go there and there's one coach and he teaches 30 people. Usually each coach might have a handful of fighters that he works with and he focuses on them and takes them to competitions. And that's kind of his main focus. Well, when I started going to this gym, I really wanted to get this coach to notice me because I wanted to train with him. And I, you know, I just, everything he taught me or I learned from him, you know, I treated like it was gold. And so finally, after about three or four months of following him around and showing up at the gym when I knew he was going to be there, he started kind of paying a little bit of attention to me and giving me some information and started helping me out a little bit. And it only took about two or three weeks. And he told me, if I really wanted to be good at boxing, I should start doing Tai Chi and meditation. Mm. And at the time, I'm this dumb 19-year-old kid that doesn't know much of anything. And I'm thinking about Tai Chi. Isn't that for like old people in the park? How is that going to help me be a better boxer, right? And I started doing it. And it changed my whole life in so many ways. And so it's very applicable However, when you're relating it to martial arts in the beginning, it's not always easy to see all of the applications, but there are many, you know, it helps you be more focused. It helps you stay, you know, bring yourself back to center and in any kind of combat situation, you get distracted for a half a second. You already got hit two or three times. And so mm -hmm. learning how to keep that focus is very valuable but then it also improves your own interpersonal awareness, which helps you be quicker. It helps your structural speed. It helps your foundation. It helps your structure and power. There's many different ways that it can affect your outcome. And if you look now, especially you know within these last 20 years, at a lot of professional athletes, not just fighters, they're adapting these meditative arts to help them in their athletic performance. So it's across basketball, football, baseball. I mean, everywhere people are using these practices because of all of the benefits that they offer. And what I noticed, because as you and I were talking before, you know, we got this interview going that I've done some studying with a particular martial art for about 10 or some odd years. And like any sort of physical activity, whether it be tennis or skiing um, or Kempo Karate in that case, that my, whatever was going on with me mentally had a direct connection to what was going on with me physically and my ability to perform in conjunction with other people. And that's why I've always been so attracted to physical disciplines, whatever they are, because they're, they're the, one of the greatest learning opportunities I think we have is to go back to your body and to learn what you, what you can learn there, because it will have affect how you interact with other people. And I think this has also got great benefit for 
um, companies, organizations, t- leaders, teams to be able to have that ability, that focus, like what you're talking about, to bring yourself back to your own body, because that's where <laughs> that's where intimacy, creativity, empathy, innovation, all those things that we so desire come from that spot, which you're talking about. Exactly. And so with the meditative arts, one of the things that we focus on is the what I call the five regulations. So regulating the body, regulating the breath, regulating the mind, regulating the energy and regulating the spirit. Hmm. All of those things and having a deeper connection in those five areas are extremely powerful to help us have different energetic expressions to be more in tune in conversations or negotiations or whatever it is that we're doing. And if, uh, you know, we, we mentioned earlier talking a little bit about uh, The Yielding Warrior, which is my most recent book, yielding is an extremely powerful concept. And yielding, there's three different kinds of yielding. There's physical yielding, mental yielding, and emotional yielding. Physical yielding is what we do a lot in martial arts or athletics, where it's a physical sport, where it's kind of the idea that, you know, I push you, you push me, whoever's the bigger, stronger person with the most leverage is going to eventually push the other person over. But with yielding, instead of us trying to see who the bigger meathead is, when you push me, I get out of the way of your force. And so now I can respond with less effort. Now, it's easy to understand how this could be beneficial in a martial arts encounter or a self-defense confrontation. Any athletic sport that you play, whether it's football, basketball, anything where there's any kind of contact or even mental strategy can use this concept of yielding. And Mm. so this is what we call physical yielding. And now in order to be good at physical yielding, A lot of things have to come into play. You need to be well-rooted. The lower part of your body needs to be strong and flexible so you can change your central equilibrium without getting tight. The body has to be relaxed. The breath has to be calm and the mind has to be present. Now, once you start to do this and you start to kind of follow this path, this is where it becomes very interesting because when you start to see all those things more clearly inside yourself... Now you also start to see those things more clearly in other people. And this is where we kind of start moving into what I call mental yielding. Mental yielding, say, for example, I say something that unsettles you and I pick up on it when it's very small. It's a lot easier for me to adjust the conversation and keep us in a happy place than if I'm not paying attention and pretty soon I'm so far off track, you want to knock me upside the head. Learning how to use yielding in all of your interactions is very powerful because you can lead the interactions to a positive direction. One, you're just being more considerate to the people around you, but also it gives you a strategy to get a desired outcome. And so mental yielding is a very powerful tool that we use all of the time. Then we move into what we call emotional yielding. And emotional yielding is very much like mental yielding, but it's with your own interpersonal conflicts. So you think about when something happens to us, oftentimes we'll respond and we'll go down this path and we might get an hour, a day, a week down that road and realize maybe that wasn't the best choice. But with yielding, if we could have taken a step back and noticed it when it first happened, before it gained too much momentum, it's a lot easier to sit back and say, ah, maybe this is a better approach. And you know, the funny thing is I've been explaining yielding for years. And oftentimes when I talk about, you know, the physical, mental, and emotional yielding, people will tell me, ah, that makes a lot of sense. You know, I do that all the time. And a hundred percent, I agree. I think we all do that to some degree all of the time. However, it's kind of like, If you or I were to walk into a crime scene with a detective who's been on the job for 30 years, he would see things about that crime scene, about the timeline and the series of events that happened that I know I would have no clue of. And the meditative arts helps us see things in ourselves and in other people that 99% of the people out there, unless they have a meditative practice, will never see that and never experience that because they're not that in tune with what's going on internally. And the meditative arts 
from what I can tell is the only way to really get that depth and understanding of that awareness. So I'm, I'm tracking with you, Jeff. So I have one question that I'm thinking, you know, as a listener, <clears throat> wondering if they have this question. So when you start talking about mental yielding, again, I'm not that um, detective like you are seeing the crime scene. So I'm going to come at it with maybe a perspective that is uh, not as refined as yours. But if I have this mental yielding, what about the idea of being an advocate for yourself? I mean, could one interpret mental yielding as being passive or being a doormat for other people that your desires and needs for moving forward in whatever it is? I'm not saying that we need to be aggressive and get into conflict, but um, I could see where somebody's listening to go like, wait a minute, I, I don't want to be any more passive than I already am. And that's what it sounds like you're telling me that I need to be. No. So that's a great question. And, you know, I've, I've had that come up many, many times. I'm sure you did. And I knew often, it, but I had to ask it. And, and oftentimes, you know, it'll be somebody who's very stoic and I'll start talking to them about yielding and they'll be like, wait, I can make this happen. I can beat this guy. I don't need to yield to his force. And the, I, I'm not telling you to give up and, and submit to somebody I'm telling people to think and be strategic to get to where you want to go with the least amount of force that's mm. needed to get the outcome that you want to see. And a lot of times, if you can give them an inch, you can redirect it and take it a lot further in the direction you want to go rather than just collapsing and letting them have a mile. And, I, and the, the hardest way that I can... Sorry, the only way I can really explain what that feels like, the way you describe it, is through movement. Um, that's somehow like I, I, I'm right when you're talking, I can get put myself right back on a mat somewhere, you know, in pure Arizona, working with Scott Gonzalez and, and going through some sort of a technique or something. And I could see what you're talking about. But the way it first comes to me is through a physical situation versus a, a mental one, even though we're talking about a mental right. yielding. It's fascinating, but I think you're on to something really important. Um, go back to, you said earlier that we all can have different types of meditative practices. It doesn't have to be the same thing. For example, there was, you know, I've, I've been on a meditative path, uh, different parts of my life. And, and it was one where you sat for a long time. <laughs> And, um, you know, the certain practices out there will say you need to have, you know, a certain word or words that you need to be focusing on. Transcendental meditation back in the 60s and 70s talked about that. What's your mantra? You know, focus on that while you're also doing your breathing. And um, I somehow wonder these two things. One, I find that my meditative state is easier achieved through movement, like Tai Chi, like through uh, a walk in the forest, you know, that to me is very meditative. I come back, I went skiing this last weekend and I remember being out in the sun and like I've had moments of true sublime meditative experience just on a, on a slope, you know. Um, but I also sometimes tell myself this trick of where I think, oh, wait a minute, it isn't part of the process of sitting for 20 minutes or two and a half hours as the case may be. To be able to quiet the mind, am I, and am I cheating the opportunity to sit and deal with my mind's chatter by not uh, meditating in that way, but by doing something that is more physical? What's your take on that? A few things. Uh, so first off, when you're doing an activity like walking in the park or maybe snow skiing or whatever it is that you're doing. I think those can have some meditative elements to them and get into kind of a rhythm or almost a, um, a flow state kind mm. of, kind of situation. When you're trying to use your mind to think about, oh, there's a rock there. I can't step on that. Or there's a tree there. I don't want to hit that when I'm going down the hill, you're outwardly projecting your focus. While you can get to a flow state while you're outwardly projecting your focus, 
my idea of meditation, whether it's through a movement meditation, a sitting meditation, a standing meditation, or a walking meditation, is that we take 100% of our focus and turn it internal. And so it's hard to do that when you're skiing down the slope. And so you can do that through a movement practice that you've memorized and done 10,000 times because you don't need to think about watching somebody or following a video. It's all internal and you're listening to the subtle connections of everything happening. It's just kind of like, you know, you go to grab a glass of water. Most people think you extend your arm, you pick up the glass, you bring it to your face. Well, it, really, there's thousands of things happening in the way that you transfer the weight in the body, the tension in your leg as maybe you shift your weight, the breath as you use to pick up the, the glass, the, the all of the little subtle muscles inside of the the hand, how they act and work together kind of like a dance as you move. There's all of these things that happen. And if you were to pick up that glass a hundred times, you could never do it exactly the same way any two times. And so the meditative arts, whether you're doing a movement meditation or you're doing a still meditation, help us to pay attention to all of those little subtle connections inside the body and whether it's a physical connection or a mental connection through getting distracted and coming back to center. Hmm. Good point. So again, it sounds like what you're saying, if I were again, listening in on this, that it, it's optimal to find your own meditative process, if you can. Um, and, and what would your recommendation be uh, to be able to, to identify that? I mean, how do, if I'm completely un familiar with meditation and you just told me that there's several different ways in which to do it how do i know which one's mine right that's a process of figuring it out and seeing how you feel when you do the practice i think you can shorten up that that timeline just by maybe asking yourself a few questions one is, do you feel comfortable sitting for a period of time? Do you need to be more active? Is your mind really hard to slow down and stay focused? Because for somebody like that, I would recommend picking up a movement meditative practice for at least in the beginning. You know, and for, for me, I do both still and movement meditations. I think they both have different pluses and minuses to them and are both very valuable. But for the beginner, somebody who's just starting, you don't need to have a bunch of different things that you're doing. Find one that you enjoy, whether it's a Tai Chi form, a Qigong set, a sitting meditative practice, a standing meditation, something that you can do comfortably for 20 minutes a day and be consistent with that. Hmm. And then also integrate in... Uh, and along with that is the active practices. And, you know, even if you just did five to 10 of those a day, every hour or every other hour, where you just come back for one minute, two minutes, three minutes, whatever it is, and count some breaths, or maybe do a soft movement exercise, something to bring that awareness back in. Then once you have that, the most important thing to really see the benefits of the practice is just to be consistent, you know, mm. be there, believe that you're doing something good for yourself and know that you are, and just kind of follow that path. And, and everything's going to unfold if you do that. And it doesn't take much. And believe me, I always tell my students this when they come into the academy, if you follow this approach and you do a meditative practice for 20 minutes a day, and you do these active practices, maybe say five times a day, and you do that every day for a year, I would bet 99% of the people that did that would never stop the practice because they'd see so many benefits from the practice that there, there's no reason why they would ever stop. The ones that yeah. stop the practice are the ones that don't have the discipline and don't have the why to make them want to follow through in the beginning to get to where they see all the, the true benefits of the practice. You mentioned something that's interesting, that they don't have a strong enough why. Um, 
what is a strong enough why? I mean, especially for people who don't know the benefit, it it may sound like <clears throat> at work. It may sound uncomfortable. <laughs> it may sound um, scary. Um, it might bring up feelings for me, and I don't want to deal with them. You know. So how, what kind of whys are you finding, or is an example of a why that seems to allow a person to have that discipline, even when they might say, eh, I'm tired. I'd rather not sit today. I'm going to go back to bed. Yeah. So I think it's important that you do think about this because that's, what's going to carry you through those days when you don't feel like, Hey, maybe I'll just skip today, you know, and where right. our minds are always going to be playing those tricks on us. So if you are somebody who is dealing with stress or dealing with anxiety or dealing with depression, those are all really good reasons to have a strong why, because it's been proven that the meditative arts can help with any of those things. Hmm. Maybe you're somebody who is an athlete wanting to improve their performance this is another reason why you would want to be consistent with it. You know, did you know that uh, when uh, Phil Jackson was coaching the Chicago Bulls, that he used to have his players doing Tai Chi and meditation? Yes, I do Here, remember you that. Got the, you, you got the yeah. best the best ball players in the world, and their coach is telling them to do meditation. So you'd think maybe you know there's there's enough around to something. There's enough people out there that <laughs> that know something, right? Yeah. And so. You, you want to, and you know, it could be for you, maybe you're in a sales position or you want to be a better leader, having a more in tune connection with who you are and being able to use the concept of yielding in your negotiations and everything you do can help you reach more success in your career. And so there's so many different ways that it can be applied. And that's why so many professionals, not just athletes, you look, you go to a lot of business seminars now and they're teaching meditation at their business seminars. That's so true. You know, and 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 it's it's extremely valuable. You just got to find out what it is for you, how it can benefit you, and then use that as kind of a motivator to keep you on track. You mentioned the word stress, and I just want to share a quick little story that really brought to light for me. Um, the way in which we hold in stress in our bodies and how that becomes a health issue, a focus issue, depression issue, and so forth. And so I was doing this, it was several years ago, um, and it was back when I was studying Kempo Karate, and they brought in this guy, I think his name was Martin Wheeler, and he was an expert in what's called Sistema. And it's basically a, a relaxation you wouldn't really call it a martial art, but a lot of martial artists use system as a way to being able to get the tension out of your body. So a lot of breathing, a lot of movement meditation that we were doing. And so there was one particular time when he was practicing a punch and using another person as an example. So he, he hit somebody in the stomach and that person sort of like shuck it out. And then um, I thought, well, that's, that's no big deal. I mean, I'll give it a shot. So I'll be the guinea pig. So he then um, had one punch where he wasn't really giving his energy behind it. And then another punch, which looked absolutely the same to everybody else, where he did have the energy behind it. And it about, you know, caused me to throw up. I mean, it was it was throughout my entire body. And the process really said something to me, because afterwards, he says, when we receive the punch, yes, there is strain that happens in the body. But then the body then holds on to that tension and doesn't let it go. And I thought, God, that's an incredible metaphor. Like we have an issue with an employee or a client or a boss and something happens to us. Sure, it hits, hits our psyche, hits our body. But then what we normally do is we hold on to it and we keep it in our bodies for a long period of time. And we think about it and we, we wake up in the morning and we regurgitate that same issue. And now all of a sudden that stress starts to manifest within our body versus what this particular practice was saying is, okay, you got hit. How do you get that energy out of your body? How do you move it through you versus holding on? And I thought, God, that physical metaphor was just brilliant for so many other types of stress situations that I and other people go through that it just opened up so many different, you know, ways of thinking. 
So yes, uh, a- along along with kind of that idea is very similar with using these practices because by any time we get into a stressful situation, a lot of times what happens is that stressor, like you said, it happens to us, and then we start focusing on it, and it continues to build and sometimes it sticks around for a day or a week or a month or whoever knows how serious it is right but if we're so in tune of learning how to bring our focus back to center and notice things before they gain too much momentum it's a lot easier to pick up a pebble off the hill before it turns into an avalanche right and so learning how to use the meditative arts to train ourselves to follow that path of least resistance, coming back to the idea of yielding in everything we do is an extremely powerful tool. So speaking of yielding, tell us about the book. Uh, The book came out in August. It's called The Yielding Warrior. Um, If you'd like a free copy of that, you can go to theyieldingwarrior.com forward slash book and just pay for shipping and handling and get a free copy of the book. Uh, It's one that uh, I put kind of my heart and soul into for, you know, my experience over the last 36 years in the martial arts and meditative arts. And um, hopefully you enjoy it. Well, I'll definitely will. And I hope others who are listening in on this particular episode uh, will as well. What other types of ways can people connect with you, Jeff, um, and, and your programs? And I know that you're based out of Portland. Do you do some of your work outside of that area? Yeah, so we have the academy here at Portland. Um, we've got classes seven days a week. Uh, it's a pretty large academy. Lots of students. I have I have students that have been with me here for 30 years. Wow. It's kind of like my second family here. And, uh, um, I'm also available for seminars and go out and, uh, teach at different locations as well. I also have an online program for the meditative arts called the yielding warrior. And you can look at that at the yielding that teaches you how to build a personalized meditation program from your home. Hmm. Fantastic. Jeff, very important work that you're doing. I really appreciate it. It's been really good to get to know you. Thank you very much. It's been an honor to be on.